1989 was a big year for the world. No, really. The Simpsons and Seinfeld debuted. Pete Rose was banned from baseball for sports gambling. The Berlin Wall was taken down. And bread was only 61 cents. These all lack to the real gem of this era being Prince of Persia. Yes, a fictional story about a time-traveling prince is way more important than the fall of communism. Aww. Don't you dare judge me. But with this new game franchise, we didn't see the explosion and over-monetization of this product. Of course, merchandise has been sold, but the franchise featured only four digital-slash-physical novels or comics, one feature-length film, 15 video games, and one VR escape room adventure. It's all condensed, yet the story is so convoluted but it's all served on a silver platter thanks to Jordan Mechner, the creator of Prince of Persia. With all this said and the newest game releasing, I decided to play the entire franchise. I remember as a kid I always wanted to play this series, but it never came into fruition. I was a busy 10 year old back then playing with my Pokemon cards and messaging strangers on AIM. But here's how it's gonna work. I'll be ranking all of these games from S tier being the true glorious heavens of gaming, all the way down to the stinky stank rat abyss of F tier. And they're all my opinions. If I say something a little mean or exaggerated about your favorite game, it's no hard feelings. I respect this franchise immensely, no matter how good or bad the games actually are. That's it for the intro. Let's start from the beginning with the original Prince of Persia. This game was a revolutionary creation because of the implementation of rotoscoping. Jordan recorded his brother running, jumping, and climbing to later trace frame by frame the animations for how the game would look. For its time, the animations are incredibly smooth, the game having a time limit is something we almost never see nowadays. Of course there are time trials or something similar, but never a full game. And this literally leads to a game over screen. That's fine, I have an hour. It can't be that hard. WRONG! This is genuinely one of the hardest games I've ever played. Since there's no time for a tutorial, they just throw you to the sultans to try and figure out the controls yourself. Being a game made in 89, I'm not surprised as older games never held your hand with anything, but you'd think they would throw you a bone once in a while- WRONG! WRONG AGAIN! These devs were ruthless in trying to kill the player and delay every second they could so you would inevitably lose. The traps are well put together and feels like a huge labyrinth. Every direction and step you take you find yourself second guessing. As you play more and more, the game of course becomes easier in some ways. There's a lot of trial and error when it comes to this game, as I was surprised if anyone beat this game in their first playthrough. The combat is pretty basic, I would say, and any time I tried blocking, I always got hit, so that meant for me to wait and attack when the AI would push in. I'm not sure if it was on my end, but I did have slight input lag, which just added to the madness. It's truly brutal, but beating this game is a huge feat, and if you have, I commend you, sir or madam. One very last note is defeating the Shadow Man. It's basically a mirror image of yourself. If you kill him, you die as well. I won't spoil the end because I think it was really well done, and you should go play it yourself. After the video, of course. <laughs> Stay here. Overall, I was surprised and blown away by how good and challenging the game was. It kind of holds up to this day solely on the animations. It's definitely a frustrating experience, with certain levels needing to be precisely traversed, otherwise you're stuck. Basic mechanics, and very little sound design. <laughs> I'll give it a B. Next is the sequel, Prince of Persia 2, The Shadow and the Flame. Unlike the experience I had with the original Prince of Persia, this sequel is so horrendously made. Shadow and the Flame takes place 11 days after the first story. Jafar is back to steal your girl and he does just that. You know how I said the first game just tries to kill you? Well that's this game, but pumped with 17 ass injections of tea. The physics are heavy, the enemies are twitchy and speedy as hell. Half the time my character is glitching through the floor, not jumping at the correct time because oh there's more input lag in this game than the last, and the level design just straight trapping you with no way out. This is probably the worst level design I've seen in all of the Prince of Persia games, which is a shame because all of the others in the franchise have decent if not really great mapping. I guess the only inch they give you is making the combat be luck based. If you get blocked while making an attack, you get hit. If you get parried, you get hit. And if you jump on a sleeping skeleton, prepare to get giga dumpster fucked into a wall of spikes. <laughs> the piss in the flame gets an F. Everyone knows nothing ends with a sequel. To wrap this trilogy up, we have 
Prince of Persia Arabian Nights, or also known as Prince of Persia 3D. This game really has me torn because half the time I'm surprised at how well done this game is with the level designs, multiple weapons you can use, platforming, and puzzles. And then I think how bad some of the level designs are, how frustrating the combat can be with these overtuned AI, a camera that is impossible to work with, which just makes platforming that much harder, and puzzles. Well, I'm not the biggest fan of puzzles, alright? Luckily, this game does not have a time limit, which is great. Because you'll spend most of the time dying with how many one-shot kill traps there are, and precarious ledges that you pray your character will grab onto. Ah! I know it's been done before, but having a save point at the start of the level and never implementing them after multiple segments of combat or tricky platforming makes the game so much more frustrating than it has to be. Along with the limited save points, there's limited health pots as well, but with a stipulation. Here's a health pot, but don't step on that low texture pressure plate. Here's another one, but it's in this secret side room that's hidden by this stone slabbed bed, and the list really does go on. The bow and arrow was a nice addition to have in the point of killing a ranged enemy, getting an advantage on a melee enemy before engaging combat, or help with completing puzzles. To be honest, I took a look at Prince of Persia 3D on PC, and it looked like a much smoother and easier experience than mine was on the Dreamcast version, so that may have skewed my ranking, but that's just how the dice rolls sometimes, baby. Arabian Nights gets a D. After 24 years since the first Prince of Persia came out, the start of the second trilogy begins with Prince of Persia The Sands of Time. Going back to when I was a child, this was the game that I always wanted to play, and I'm saddened that I didn't play this earlier. Sands of Time is a true masterpiece of a game in that the story is really engaging and definitely elevated with the incredible voice acting from Yuri Lowenthal, Joanna Wasik, and Barry Denon. The game starts off with your invasion of a neighboring kingdom. During that commotion, you find and steal the Dagger of Time where you're advised by a vizier to stab the blade into a sacred hourglass. By doing so, you release the Sands of Time, which engulfs and changes everyone into a monster of the sand, including your father. Throughout this fantastic game, everything feels so responsive, the map design is well done, the graphics and characters are honestly good for its time in 2003, and I think they hold up in a charming way. The platforming, map traversal, and puzzles placed throughout this game is some of the best I've ever seen. And of course, the time reversal mechanic will always be one of the greatest creations in gaming. I will say the combat is nothing to write home about, but you can do some awesome acrobatic attacks as well as strategize how you want to use your petrifying blade while engaged with the enemy, whether it be slowing down time or knifing enemies into sand to get easy kills on bigger and tougher enemies. Any praise I give this game will never do it justice at just how much I enjoyed playing it. Don't be like little baby me, you just have to play it. I will say though the end boss fight was the worst part of the whole game, that kind of sucked. But thankfully it didn't detract my love for Sands of Time, it's an S. We're in the masterful juicy days of the pop franchise, because next is Prince of Persia Warrior Within. This game kept every piece of platforming, wall running, and movement from Sands of Time, but placed more emphasis on combat. So, they create more fighting mechanics with proper combos, picking up enemy weapons, and multiple sand powers that you acquire along your journey. With the ramping strength your character receives, the devs had to do the same for your enemies, which is why the game made the AI exponentially harder compared to the Sands of Time. I found it to be frustrating in some areas because you can softlock yourself if you reach a checkpoint with a low amount of HP and minimal sand gauges to reverse time. This means you have to play perfect or be forever farmed by juiced up attackers. Not to mention the amount of dogpiling the AI does on you while you're on the ground. Your roll doesn't provide you with any iframes, which means you're taking damage in just about every fight unless you cheese the enemies in some capacity, like throwing <laughs> multiple off the edge, <laughs> me. In the game, you transition to the past and present multiple times, and I think the attention to detail in these levels was really great. In the past, these traps are moving swiftly and how they're actually supposed to operate, but when you transport back to the present, those traps are slower moving, clearly aged, or completely destroyed. 
it's interesting to see the prints in a game like this, with it being much more gruesome and blood-filled compared to Sands of Time, and for me it felt like less of a Prince of Persia game. When I envision the Prince, I view an acrobatic and stealthy assassin-based character. But instead, you just kind of brute force your way to the finish line with the new combat abilities, weapon throws, and way more boss fights. Not to say this is a bad thing, but it feels like you're engaged in way too many drawn out fights with how the enemy's health works, which to my understanding is random. I'll fight an enemy of the same exact type that will get one shot from a two button combo, then fight another of the same type, hit him 20 times, and he just never dies? It makes it incredibly confusing as the player, which makes me fall back on reliable combos that are sometimes consistent or seem to do more damage. Warrior of Thin does a lot of things right and was a great sequel overall with amazing boss fights that made me coming back for more. Because I died a bunch of times. Look out, kickflip! It's an A. To round off the second trilogy of the series, we have Prince of Persia The Two Thrones. To be honest, at the beginning of this game, I really thought this would give Sands of Time a run for its money because I was really enjoying the platforming, new additions on how to traverse the castle, the addition of stealth kills, and of course bringing over many great things from the previous two games in this series. I progressed further on and found my enjoyment for this was sinking in the sand in which it was created from. The combat system, while taking core elements from Sands of Time with advancements from Warrior Within, was good, but they transitioned it in such a janky way. How your character would leap over enemies and being an acrobatic killer was made worse from Warrior Within. The actions that I input confused the game in thinking I'm doing something completely different. If I'm too close to the wall, my character does a wall attack rather than continuing to attack in front of me. This mess of coding even shows during times of platforming. I could run straight forward and my character will always jump a little to the right or left or even miss the mark completely. I think the cinematic parts of the game were done really well, but when the boss fights come around, it just falls flat. The gimmick in this game is that the prince is corrupted by the sands and during different segments, he'll change into this corrupted form where really the main difference is he has a chain whip which does significantly more damage and his health drains over time so you have to kill enemies or break vases and hope you get a sand drop. Bringing back Yori Lowenthal as the main voice actor for the prince felt so much better though as hearing his narration of lines gives the prince so much more emotion. I know too well what he is capable of but I intend to find him and punish him for what he has done to my kingdom. Overall, it was a good ending to the trilogy, never perfect, but much better than other game trilogies that we've seen come and go. It's a B. Now that we've gotten past the beefy trilogies of the franchise, let's take a look at a little quirky strategy game in Battles of Prince of Persia. Unfortunately for me, I don't like these types of drawn out strategy games, but I do really like that they made it into a deck builder to give the game a little personality. Gradually, I was getting more and more into the game as I found the beginning to be quite boring. There's a ton of different units that you see and can play as. I played the campaign mode, but there's a variety of units like swordsmen, pikemen, archers, multi-archers, cavalry, archery cavalry, catapults, and a ton of different generals that have different abilities. Canonically, this game falls between Sands of Time and Warrior Within, so the story involves the prince fighting these battles between different kingdoms to try and find a way to free him from the pursuit of the Dahaka, which is after you because you interfered with time and cheated your own death on multiple occasions. You see the Dahaka to be a much more prevalent enemy in Warrior Within, which we already showed. In this game, there's no voice acting and the soundtrack is forgettable. The battlefields are interesting with the different terrains and the strategy of facing enemies from the side or flanking to get an advantage is kind of different, but I didn't find this to be a game I would ever seek out. And with that, I'll give it a C. It looks like we're rolling with a remake of the original in Prince of Persia Classic. Right away, I would describe this more of a remaster than a remake because the levels, character, enemies, and everything in between got a graphic and mechanic update, but everything mirrored the original, where the enemies spawn, all the traps, the health pots, and mega pots, pretty much everything is the same as the 1989 version, 
except that it's just overall more responsive and finer tuned, which was definitely needed. The game still has a running clock of one hour, but you don't lose once that hour is up. You can keep playing, kill Jafar, which is the final boss, and still rewarded with a happily ever after end screen. Since it's pretty much the same game with better tuning, while also being less frustrating and didn't make me want to rip my hair out, I'll still give it a B, as it's just an upgrade from an already revolutionary game. The next game was said to reboot the entire franchise in Prince of Persia 2008. It was odd at first going from the 2000s trilogy of wall running and its physics system to this, which feels a little more realistic until the platforming evolves into roof running, continuation parkouring around precarious open faced boulders and never being able to die if I miss a key jump because Elika, your magic using companion, is always there to save you. I genuinely think this has just as great platforming and movement as the trilogy with its own spin in the prince having a claw glove which he can use to break his fall and climb even higher if need be. The verticality in this game makes this adventure a truly epic experience which is only complemented by the new combat system which once again they made into being more cinematic and visually stunning. With the regression of freeform movement as whenever you're engaged in a fight there's an invisible barrier around the fighting grounds. This makes for fast cutscenes or quick time events that occur to allow for more damage. It's not my favorite, but still an interesting twist as the game mainly focuses on the open world platforming. The central location at the temple where Elika's father releases the evil Aramon by cutting down the tree of life, this spreads the corruption at the beginning of the game, and now you must travel to these four broadened areas and restore their fertile grounds. Each location has six sub areas to explore and restore. To unlock more areas, you must collect enough light seeds. I found this part of the game to be a bit tedious, but it does give the game a chance to show off the many areas you can reach, as well as lets the player really take in the beauty of each location. I was very surprised at how well this game was done, whether it be the visuals, the soundtrack, the voice acting, the story, the puzzles, or the incredible flow you get while platforming. Prince of Persia 2008 stands strong on fertile grounds and gets an S. Another change in the pop franchise brings us to Prince of Persia The Fallen King. This game picks up from Prince of Persia 2008 with its own art style and direction, taking advantage of the Nintendo DS, specifically the stylus and touchscreen as your only actions can be made by doing so. The combat isn't super advanced and the boss fights are straightforward, which is fine because the game's level design, maneuvers, and puzzles are what make the game unique compared to other Prince of Persia games. Having your companion be Zhao was refreshing as you can use his powers to reach greater heights, help with puzzles, and finish boss fights off. I couldn't get around to enjoying the game fully because the stylish control scheme was rough to get used to. I think if the game was an open world like the previous Prince of Persia we spoke about and added a Metroidvania style to the game, I feel it would have done much better. But instead we're given this stage based level system which nowadays is a bit dated. The game never really captured my interest so I'm gonna go with a C. And now we're back into the third dimension with Prince of Persia The Forgotten Sands The Forgotten Sands might be one of the funniest Prince of Persia games out there because of the graphical twitchiness that came with the PS3 port. This must be what she meant by giving me more time. Are these the powers of the gene? The whole time I'm thinking there's a glitch in the matrix and won't last too long, but it happens in every cutscene. It's a classic in the Ubisoft production to make someone's inner mouth be fully shown while also having their eyes pop out, making them look like that villain from Who Framed Roger Rabbit. When I kill your brother, I talk! Yes! Wait! These graphical monstrosities weren't my only threat with the game, as they went from fighting against four challenging enemies in the 2000s trilogy to fighting 50 brainworm controlled AI. This makes you lose that intimate feeling with the enemies that you're engaged with. For example, whenever I would encounter an acrobatic ninja woman or exploding dog from Warrior Within, I would feel nervous because I know if I don't play right, I'm going all the way back to the faraway save point. In Forgotten Sands, I have an army on my screen and I think, 
what power can I one-shot these enemies with this time, whether it be the Wind Tornado, Ice Blast, or Trail of Fire. These combat encounters feel more like a chore rather than a rewarding one. That being said, I do like the skill tree feature. It feels much more modern in that you can customize and play how you like. And just to touch on it, the boss battles were not that great. I would go so far as to say that Prince of Persia as a franchise has some of the most dull boss fights, which is a bit disappointing. The most engaging ones actually came from Warrior Within. The Forgotten Sand still features many fun gameplay segments, platforming feels interesting and creative with the elemental manipulation powers, and the camera angles provide the player with a much better overall experience than what I was given with Warrior Within and Two Thrones. I would say it's on the lower end of A. Onto the second and last remake as of this recording, Prince of Persia 2 The Shadow in the Flame Remake. It's interesting looking at this game compared to the other remake slash remaster of Prince of Persia Classic because this game changed many key points. Levels are different, graphical design is different, and the controls are updated to feel more modern compared to the sand-covered fossil of the older game. Obviously, it needed to be revamped since original Shadow in the Flame was poorly planned and thought out. They did keep the original story, which I never had a problem with. It's still captivating, but if it's led with clunky gameplay, it'll never thrive. The game is alright and much better than the original, but I'm not swayed to enjoy it as it's just another feeble mobile game. I'll give it a D for didn't suck, but kinda. Ubisoft loves its mobile games, so here's another one, Prince of Persia Escape. This is a side-scrolling auto-runner that is littered with ad pop-ups after every two to three levels, which- Raid, Shadow Legends, Champions, Skins, Battles, Champions, bye, 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 or you're a fucking pussy. I found it to be decently challenging as it makes me much more engaged while I'm sitting on the toilet playing this game. It's not the worst platforming, but you're still just tapping the screen when needed, so it lacks mechanics and gameplay elements. Graphically, it mirrors the original 1989 game, so the continuity is nice, and your real goal besides beating the level is to collect gems throughout the game to unlock cosmetics. I mean, it runs well and it's difficult in ways, but having ads thrown in my face while playing any video game is horrendous. I'll generously give this an E. I bet you didn't know Ubisoft came out with a VR escape room game in Prince of Persia The Dagger of Time. Personally, I couldn't get my hands on this. There's tons of VR escape rooms and arcades that are shut down around me in upstate New York, and the only one that I thought would be my best bet was in New York City, the Big Apple. So I called that location too, and they said they didn't have it. It's incredibly hard to pinpoint where this game is or how good it is because there's so little information on the game from review sites. Even on Ubisoft's website, you try to find locations of where this game could be, and they just tell you to call your local VR escape rooms for further information. Huh? I'm sorry to disappoint, but please leave in the comments if you have played this game and tell us how it was. On to another mobile game and its sequel, Prince of Persia Escape 2. Picture everything I said from the first escape game, and that's basically this. An auto runner and gem collecting simulator, a glorified toilet game where once again you're bombarded with advertisements, but only when you open the game for the first time. The second time I opened the game, I had minimal to no advertisements and enjoyed the game much more as there's new animations for certain platforming segments and even boss fights. It was actually a step up from the first game, and I'll award its effort with a D. Here we are. We travel back in time as the sands allowed, and the journey finally reaches the present with Prince of Persia The Lost Crown. The first real Prince of Persia game since the Forgotten Sands 14 years ago, and the creators really came through for the fans. It felt as if the franchise was pigeonholed into only using the prince and never being able to jump outside the box because of the long history and reputation that came from the 2000s trilogy, but the writers did an excellent job in creating a totally new story. You start the game off being introduced as one of the seven immortals, and for the first time ever, your character actually has a name in Sargon. The story leads you to journey the vast and ever-corrupted kingdom of Mount Kof. It's a 2.5D Metroidvania style game, and you can tell everyone involved put a lot of care into the creation of this game, while also taking a bunch of inspiration from other games like Ori and the Will of the Wisps, Hollow Knight, and Elden Ring. 
Visually, I think they did an amazing job, and channel shifting colors during key cinematic moments creates this aura around your character that I love. Not only does the foreground look great, but the background sceneries are gorgeous. The combat is rewarding and only feels better after going through the training and learning all the essential combos. The puzzles, while not having a ton thrown at you, are still really great. The soundtrack and sound effects are subtle, but very calming, and they ramp those up once combat ensues. I love these types of games so much, and I think The Lost Crown is one of the best games from the entire franchise, as you're not looking at the same environment for 10 hours straight, the traversal evolves as the story moves along, there's a good bit of customization for the character in both cosmetics and gameplay with the trinkets, upgrade system, and Athra special moves. I think if they keep moving in this direction and really flush out the world in later games, this has the potential to bring Prince of Persia back from the Corrupted Sands. The world does not revolve around you, young man. It's an S. And that ends this glorious tier list. I had a lot of fun playing this entire franchise, and I really hope- What about the movie? What? You know, the movie with Jack Gyllenhaal? Do you mean Jake Gyllenhaal? The MTV award winner for best kiss in Brokeback Mountain? <laughs> yeah, whatever. Just talk about the movie or I'm not subscribing. All right, uh, we, we, we got a bonus. Uh, the, the Prince of Persia, the Sands of Time movie. This movie starts off with Jake Gyllenhaal not knowing what accent he really wants to use. I'm on my way. Our orders were to subdue Koshkan, not to attack Alamut. Oh, wonderful speech, base. Rousing. And then finally in the middle, he finds his stride. I don't trust you, and you're not my type. Oh, I'm not some desperate slave girl. I'm actually capable of voicing my own thoughts. Yeah, too many for my taste. Uh. As the title says, it's based off of the 2003 game Sands of Time and follows the story in some ways. I would describe this as a reimagining. It involves Dastin, holy shit, they gave him a name, as the prince who flees the city after giving his father a robe of poison or acid. Basically, he inadvertently kills his father. During the escape, Farah tags along because she wants out of the city as well, but it is also after that man's special dagger. The dagger of time, not his penis. There's a good bit of pacing issues and weird jump cuts and changing of scenes that make me go, oh, I guess we're on to another scene and location entirely with minimal explanation on how they got there. The fight scenes were all right, and they did show off some really nice acrobatics that you see from the Prince of Persia games, but I wish there were more. I crave more. I'm an addict. The acting was relatively good, and I didn't find any imposters among us, even though Jake Gyllenhaal is clearly just a Hollywood hire, whitewash of a casting on this project. The film got some piss poor reviews at the time, but I think it's an overall fun movie, not one that I would seek out, but a good turn off your brain and watch. It's a B. And now ends this forever enshrined tier list. Please let me know in the comments what your favorite games were from the series, and keep it clean. I'll see them, and don't think I won't take you out to the amazing Outback Steakhouse. We can get the Aussie staycation together, and we'll have a blast. Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed, and if you're new here, consider subscribing for more content like this. Oh, look at that. A beautiful video wrapped up to quench your thirsty needs. Go watch that, and I'll see you in the next one. Woohoo, hey, a little Easter egg moment here, me coming from the future and editing. The day that this upload is actually my birthday, so if you stayed this long, say happy birthday in the comments. And as always, thank you for everything.